Now, if all goes as planned, Chandrayaan-3 will be the world's first mission to land near the lunar south pole. Now, the most crucial objective for Chandrayaan-3 will be to make a successful soft landing on the moon. If successful, India will be the first country to send a craft that explores the moon's southern region. India will also join an elite club of three nations, only United States, Russia and China, have made a soft landing on moon till now. Through this mission, ISRO also hopes to achieve the end-to-end -end capability. This includes the capability to launch spacecrafts, land on the moon and conduct exploration missions with rovers. The Chandrayaan-3 module will begin the 384,000 km distance to the moon aboard the LVM-3 rocket in just a few hours from now. The entire payload of the mission weighs 3,900 kilograms. Now, talking about the cost, ISRO, which is known for its low-cost mission, spent just 615 crore rupees. That's around $75 million. Now, the duration of the mission is 14 Earth days or one lunar day. The Chandrayaan-3 module is expected to land on the moon in just over a month. The lander and rover modules will attempt to make a soft landing on the lunar south pole, as I mentioned, on either the 23rd of August or the 24th of August, and that depends on the sunrise on the moon. The Chandrayaan-3 mission is comprised of three parts here, that is the propulsion module, the lander module, and the rover module. The lander is named Vikram after Dr. Dr. Victor, uh, Vikram Sarabhai, the founder of ISRO, and the rover is named Pragyan. All three modules are fitted with state-of-the-art Indian technology. The propulsion module will carry the lander and the rover modules to the moon's south pole. Now, the Chandrayaan-3 module has three primary objectives to accomplish within the 14-day mission period. When it lands on the moon's surface, number one, to make a safe landing on the south pole of the moon. The second objective here is to conduct rover operations. Chandrayaan-3 will deliver a lander and the rover to the lunar surface. The rover will explore, collect samples and information about the moon's south pole. Lastly, it will conduct scientific experiments on the moon's surface. This includes analyzing the lunar soil's chemical composition as well. The lander payload has four instruments which shall do the following. First, measure the levels of plasma on the lunar surface. Then, measure the thermal properties of the lunar polar region. And then, measure the seismicity around the landing site. Fourth here, understand the dynamics of the moon system. But why is India choosing to make a soft landing on the moon's south pole? Because no other spacecraft has managed to make a soft landing on the South Pole. Previous spacecrafts have all aimed to land near the Moon's equator. This is because the equatorial area is smoother and has more sunlight for instruments. The lunar poles do not get enough sunlight and as a result, the temperature can fall to even negative 230 degrees. The lunar poles have large craters, which make for interesting exploration possibilities as well. United States Space Agency, NASA, also wants to send an astronauts to the lunar south pole. This is with the object objective here to look for frozen water or traces of it. If the Chandrayaan-3 mission is successful, the data retrieved from the rover can play an important role in the NASA mission as well. And now for more on this, we're being joined by our senior correspondent Siddharth MP from Sri Harikota, Andhra Pradesh. The launch site of Chandrayaan-3. Siddharth, thank you so much for joining us. It's a huge day for India. Everyone will be watching with big breath. Talk to us about this unprecedented feat that India is attempting. Well, to do what others have not done and to go to the unexplored regions is the dream of every space scientist. But let's remember the fact that just a handful of nations in the world have end-to-end -end space capability. There are so many countries that claim to build satellites and they rightly do so. But the fact remains that to be able to build a rocket, to be able to build a satellite, to be able to build the technology to track them, communicate with both of them all in-house is something very few nations possess. We all know that the space technology boom began during the Cold War era and that time it was the US and the Soviet Union, erstwhile Soviet Union. And thereafter there were also several other countries that picked it up. This technology was picked up by Japan, Europe had it, then 
then uh, China had it. And of course, Indian space program also began in the 60s. So when space programs begin, they go on very humble missions. They try to demonstrate their technology and prove what they can do. But uh, as the space program matures, they take up daring missions and uh, the example of such missions are India's own Chandrayaan-1 undertaken in 2008, then Mangalyaan which India undertook in 2013-14, the Mars mission. Of course, Chandrayaan-2 that India undertook in 2019 and now cut to 2023 and we have uh, Chandrayaan-3 and we are on liftoff day. So doing the unexplored, doing what people have not attempted before, exploring the unexplored and then looking for new sciences to emerge, looking for new, um, you know, signs of um, mystery. That is what every scientist is fascinated by and as a natural satellite of the Earth, Moon is the natural destination that scientists look for and that is why an important mission like Chandrayaan is being looked at. Right. To give you a global perspective, the US is planning to launch Artemis. Already the preliminary work is underway. They've launched the unmanned craft for that and they've also recovered it. Next, uh, in, in about a month from now, Russia is looking to launch Luna, 20, Luna, which is also a spacecraft. This is an unmanned spacecraft. Very soon, Japan is looking to launch one. So now there is renewed interest in the moon because humanity sees moon as a sort of uh, pit stop, which is close to Earth. Although it's four lakh kilometers away, it's seen as a pit stop because if you want to explore deep space, you might as well have a colony on the moon. And from there, you can explore deep space. So it's like an outstation that Earth can have uh, in its vicinity at about 3.8 eight four lakh kilometers away so and there's also so many mysteries about the moon that we don't understand yet and there's also uh, yeah. theories that some kind of elements found on the moon could help solve earth's energy crisis and things like that these are theories so a lot of research needs to be done and everybody is uh, who has space capability is now in a race to find out these mysteries right Thanks, Siddharth, uh, for joining us and giving us all your insights. You're, of course, there in Sri Harikota and we'll be seeing all the action happen in front of you. And we will, of course, be in touch with you later in the day as well as you bring us all the updates. All right. For more on this, we're also joined by Chris Hadfield from Ontario. He is a former commander of the International Space Station and author of the Apollo murders. Welcome to the broadcast, sir. Nice to be joining you. Pretty yeah. exciting day. Right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, now, the Lunar South Pole. You know, I want to start off right with that. Uh, you're, of course, uh, you've seen it closer than anybody else. What makes it so, uh, you know, wh why is it treacherous or why is it difficult to land there? Why has nobody ever tried it before and what makes it so difficult? So talk to us about that. Well, it's got two main attractions. I mean, if, if you look at the moon, it turns once every two weeks. But if you're right at the South Pole or right at the North Pole, you always get sunlight. So that means you can have eternal power at the North Pole and the South Pole. So that's one reason. The other is the craters at the South Pole of the moon never get light in them. And by our best guess, there's about 400 billion liters of water in the craters of the moon. So if you have the combination of eternal power at the South Pole and deep reserves of water, then suddenly it's far more attractive for human life. And that's why so many space agencies are going to the moon. But so far, we've just landed uh, close to the equator, as you've been saying. So by landing all the way down at 70 degrees south, like Chandrayaan-3 is doing, that is one giant step closer to uh, robots and then people landing and then living and working at the South Pole of the Moon. It's, it's a really complex step, and, uh, and that step is going to begin later today. Right, so well, thank you so much for that show and tell explainer. And also, I want to understand the duration of the mission is 14 Earth days, which translates to about one lunar day. The Chandrayaan-3 is expected to make a soft landing either on the 23rd or the 24th. Fourth year. Tell us about what makes days on moon so much slower. What do you mean by a soft landing here then? Well, you know, when, when you look up at the moon, you always see the same shape on the moon, you know, the same pattern. And various cultures have seen a rabbit or a face or all kinds of things in the, in the pattern on the moon. But it's always the same side of the moon that faces us. And if you think about that, the moon takes about a month to go around the world. And so that means that very slowly, in order to keep that face pointed at us, the moon is turning really slowly. And if you cut a month in half, that's about 
14 days or so. And so that's why the moon only turns once completely relative to the sun every 14 days. So if you're somebody on the moon, we're here at 70 degrees south, then the moon is going to turn relative to the sun very slowly. You'll be in the sun for 14 days, and then you'll be in the shade for 14 days. And as you mentioned at the outset there, Him, it's, uh, it gets really incredibly cold and hard to keep uh, little spaceships alive on the surface for two weeks. So everything that is going to happen on Chandrayaan 3, once it lands at, in the third week of August there, has to happen in that two-week time when that part of the moon is in the bright sunshine and collect the solar energy and keep all those science experiments alive. Right. Uh, Chris, you know, only US, Russia and China have made a soft landing on the moon till now. What does it mean for a nation to be in this elite club and how do you see India's space progress going forward? Yeah, um, you know, there are six missions planning to land on the moon or go to the moon before the end of the year. And India is out in front of all of those. But as you say, no one has soft landed on the moon except uh, the United States did, the Soviet Union did first, and then China has more recently. So it's a really, uh, not just an exclusive club, but it, it's a measure of technological capability. It's It's been something that has been beyond the capability of almost every group of people, every country on Earth throughout history. I'm from Canada. We've never landed anything on the moon. So for India to be able to do this, it shows a lot of different things. It shows uh, the advanced level of the rocket ca uh, technology that you have there on the East Coast. It shows the manufacturing capability of the engines that are going to put Chandrayaan onto the surface. But it also it's a reflection of the educational system and the the uh, highly technical manufacturing business capability that exists in India. So, and and maybe the last piece is it's something for every person in India, the most populous nation on earth, every person in the country to be able to look up and see the moon and feel a sense of, of national pride, of, of capability, of the things that we can do together when we organize ourselves. It's all of those things that, that are all wrapped up together in Chandrayaan 3 and, and, and the launch that's coming this afternoon. Right. Well, uh, Mr. Chris Hadfield, thank you so much for joining us on the show with your inputs on this. My pleasure and uh, happy launches. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.